Myron Waldman was one of the great unsung American animators, having contributed to Betty Boop, Popeye, Superman, and Casper the Friendly Ghost. He cut his teeth at Fleischer Studios back in 1931, his career culminating in 1997, when he was presented with the Windsor McKay Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Field of Animation. You started as an opaker. I happened to be very fast, so then they promoted me to inking. Fleischer's were the only studio that paid overtime. So I liked quickly that way too, and they were nice to me, the people. They had to promote people very fast, and I was lucky, and they liked what I, they saw, and they, after six months, I was animating. Of course, they give you the crowd scenes to do because nobody else wanted to do them. And uh, it finally worked out. Inside of two years, I became a head animator. Head animators were really, they were really the directors, actually. Dave Fleischer was credited with directing every single Fleischer cartoon. And he definitely had a hand in the direction of the cartoons, but a lot of the work, um, the day-to-day -day work of directing the cartoons was left to what they referred to there as the head animators. They had to be responsible for, um, well, approving the recordings because, you know, they, you had to have a um, dialogue, recorded dialogue first. And then Myron would map out the whole picture. They would be known as thumbnail sketches. They would choose the camera angles, the camera setups, and make sure that everything was going to fit together, and they would hand the work out to the animators and approve it. Dave, I consider him the best gag man I ever knew, and he knew what he was doing. Some people found him a little aggressive. I didn't. I got along very well. In fact, he once told me, your criticism hurts, but you tell the truth. <laughs> Max, of course, was a perfect gentleman all the time. I never heard him raise his voice. They asked who helped him with Betty Boo. He gave a list of four names, and he included me, too. She was a dog. And when I say dog, it's a, the animal. She had long ears. What bothered me, that her eyes were a block apart, you know? You could drive a train. We gradually pulled them closer, and it, it worked. And she didn't always have that pout when she was in a pleasant situation. So we started doing it, and we never used her in profile, because it was, it was horrible. But Pudgy, her little dog, that's all my creation. I don't know if he, if he cared for Popeye that much. I mean, um, <laughs> He always said, what did he ever see in olive oil, first of all? You know, he, he thought Popeye had poor taste <laughs> in women. <laughs> and Myron never cared for the violence that much, you know, and with, I think Can You Take It was a lot of violence in that one. Oh, yeah. Can You Take It? I did it with Tom Johnson. It was something about Popeye wanted to join their club, and they wouldn't take him because he didn't amount and they'd beat the hell out of him, you know. Then he goes, he's supposed to go through initiation, see? So there was a big folding case that had knives in it, you know, enough to kill anybody. If he, and he walks in, you hear Nader laughing happy, and you hear the thing grind to a halt, and it opens up. The knives are all bent, you know, and he's all right. Curses! At the end of it, Popeye ends up in the hospital, finding out that he couldn't take it. Olive, I think, was a nice, she gives him the spinach, he eats the spinach. And pops right back up and destroys everyone. <laughs> Most of the series is a lot of fun to watch. You get the idea that these were fun films to make. He liked the, well, he did the one called, I think it was called the Hawaiian Birds, and, and he did Mr. Bug Goes to Town. He liked the ooh and ah pictures. Those, those, those were his favorites, yeah. All with happy endings. I do remember one where uh, Seymour and I tell came over, he said, who did that animation? Thinking it was one of the coast guys that came in. I said, I did. He was very, I said, yeah, I just use more drawings like they do, you know? There was something about West Coast and East Coast animators that, you know, never the twain shall meet, kind of. Good luck, they could have it. 
Some, somebody said to me, aren't you jealous? Look at the lines around the, was it the Roxy Theater where Disney's picture was playing? I said, no, I just got a new contract with more money. That's why I should be mad. Cause I popped by the same When I look at those Superman cartoons they did, they actually look, those cartoons look like they were enthused about doing these. These were different, these were great, and they knew they were great. They didn't want to do it because it cost them, but the Paramount did give them $100,000 for each picture, and they needed it. We had specialists do different things. I did uh, the picture called the Billion Dollar Limited, which is in the archives in that museum down in Washington. Big, you know. I did the Japa tours. That was already propaganda, you know. And I remember Secretary of State came through the studio at that time, and he came through my room. Attention, all pilots! Giant bomber being stolen. Take off immediately. This looks like a job for Superman. Animation was not a one-man job, you know. Very good background artists, and we had terrific musical directors. You laid out a picture, it was like laying out a musical. He said, um, what, made him, what made him such a success, uh, and when I say success, I don't mean money wise, I mean inner contentment is success as far as I'm concerned. And he said that what made it so good for him was that he loved his work, he just loved it, really. Till the, till the very end, he just loved drawing. They can't do that for the Navy. During 1941, America instituted its first peacetime draft. Uh, the country was not yet at war, but I think it was pretty much a foregone conclusion that they would get into World War II. So this measure was implemented, and the movies tended to reflect that. We got our dander up. We, that's all we can take, you know. Um, at, as we were getting ready to go to war, that may have resonated somewhat as well with the, with the crowds. That's all I can stand, because I can't stand no more. It's interesting, Popeye as an American hero um, seemed pretty well suited for the World War II cartoons. And there's certainly a challenge of trying to adapt what was a character sort of existing in his own world to now actually being in the Navy and actually being a sailor as was in his name that whole time. So you want to be a sailor, huh? Do I want to be a sailor? I am a sailor. I am Popeye the sailor. I was born a sailor and there's nothing which I doesn't know about a ship because I am Popeye the sailor. Quiet! So the Fleischers decided to have Popeye and Bluto join the US Navy and in November 1941, a month before Pearl Harbor, they drew up a new model sheet showing the two characters in white U.S. Navy uniforms. They made it much more clean, scrubbed, and uh, much more patriotic, and, and, and much more presentable, you know, the kind of sailor you'd be more likely to take home to meet your mother or something like that, as opposed to the sort of scruffy, you know, beaten down kind of tramp sailor that he sort of was in the beginning. He enlisted in the actual Navy, not the one-man Navy he sort of had in the 30s, where he dressed up in his black committee blouse with the stripes around the collar and, the, and his mariner's hat. They, they changed him to a character that, that had uh, Navy whites. So when, when Popeye finds himself in white uniform in the Navy proper, in the mighty Navy, he's the most experienced sailor on Earth, and what's more says so, but he has real problems in getting used to the Navy way of doing things, although ultimately, of course, he becomes a hero at the end. Strangely enough, at the end of that cartoon, 
They show military insignia. He's being decorated for his uh, shooting down the enemy, and at the end of the cartoon, they hand him his picture in a circle. It's the old Popeye. That's the funny part. The picture in a circle. What's it for? The official insignia of the Navy Bomber Squadron. Now, the white uniform, sometimes varied to blue, I'm sure was not meant to be a permanent measure on the Fleischer's part. I think it's interesting that on the main titles, he appears in his, in his old costume. So I don't think that they plan to make it permanent, otherwise they would have changed that then. And who knew how long the hostilities were going to carry on for. But either way, Popeye remained in that white uniform well into the TV cartoons of the 60s, with a few odd exceptions. And I really don't think it helped the character Seagar, after all, had made the same mistake in 1929 by drawing Popeye in all-white clothing. He'd lost a lot of his visual impact and balance in that way, and I genuinely regret the switch to a, a white uniform, at least for the duration, and I do feel sure that if the Fleischers had kept control of their studio, come 1945, Popeye would have gone back to his original clothing. Man the guns and blow that dirty right out of the sky! In other parts of the world, the Popeye character was immediately recognizable as being Americana and being American. So he was definitely seen as an, an icon for America. So from the time of the mighty Navy, you do start to see a strong propaganda element creeping in. There are more of them in the earlier famous cartoons, but it is evident in some of the Fleischer films, but it wasn't something they pushed as often as, say, the Warner Brothers cartoons of the period did. The greater number of them still were about the Popeye Bluto rivalry with olive oil, and in fact, too many of them, I think, started to, uh, to follow that pattern rather than varying it with other stories as the Fleischers had done in earlier years. Hello, Uncle Popeye. Gee, it's good to have you home. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Did you shoot a lot of Japs? <laughs> Some of these cartoons are hard to get through. Uh, some of them feature pretty amazing racial imagery. Not any different than any of the other cartoons at the time. There was a notorious cartoon based on a Spike Jones record called You're a Sap, Mr. Jap, which I don't think Popeye puts on his resume anymore. It's the kind of thing where Popeye was clearly drafted into the U.S. Navy as they headed into World War II, uh, you know, and he was, he was a fighting man. He wasn't just a sailor on leave anymore. So the music and the visuals became much more oriented to the war effort. When he'd eat the spinach, even if he wasn't fighting an enemy, he was just fighting Bluto, he stars and stripes forever, some kind of John Philip Sousa thing or something like that. And sometimes his muscles, they'd show a dynamo or something like that, and other times it would be a tank. Me for victory, me will stop him. Some of the folks that were at the Fleischer studio signed up for the draft almost immediately being very interested in trying to help out. In fact, one of Fleischer's main animators was a man named Willard Bowski. He signed up right after Pearl Harbor was bombed. He joined the army, and Bowski was killed, actually, during the Battle of the Bulge. Here was a man who was really at the top of his career at the Fleischer's at the time, one of the, one of the top directors, making some of the most popular cartoons, who decides to join the army to fight for his country. This seemed to hit a lot of the famous studio's animators pretty hard at the time. Geez, that knocked me for a loop, you know? So you see it on all sides, you know? Those are the things you remember the most. You felt so badly for them, you know? It was during the war, and uh, at night, I would uh, change into my uniform and work as a gray lady at Mitchell Field Hospital, which was the receiving center for the uh, very badly wounded. Uh, so that was my nighttime life. And then during the day, it was a good level to have something that's completely off the wall. So it was good to um, have something joyous during the day. And, but you would really level yourself off when you'd go back at night and see what was happening in the real world. Certainly the war uh, was quite sobering for a lot of people. It seemed that, that the team at the studio uh, was interested in trying to produce films that were fun six minute films, but also said something. These medals we give to you for bravery and courage, too. Your tactics are different. We'll see they different. He's Popeye. Let us see the man. Oh, 
Pippi, Popeye, Peepi and Poopi, in no particular order, first appeared in a cartoon called Women is a Mystery, not as his nephews, but as the imaginary sons that Olive Oil dreams about them having when they're married. I must confess, I made a mess. And the gist of it is that she finds that these four boys have far more in common with their father than she'd like, and she can't control them. And on the strength of this nightmare, she refuses to marry Popeye, who, by the way, doesn't know anything about the dream, and of course is baffled as, as to why he's been turned down. Are you ready to set sail with me on the sea of matrimony? No! I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man on Earth, and that's final! <laughs> They never uh, appeared in the comic strip. It was like an invention of the Fleischers. I think it's because at the time Disney had uh, the three ducks, uh, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. I got to think that they were just reactions to Donald's nephews. I don't think they helped the cartoons a lot. Basically, they take the place of Sweepy, and Sweepy is a much more sympathetic character than they are. They're, they're, they're mischievous and everything like that, but they remind me of Donald's nephews, only not so nice. The gimmick is they talk like Popeye, only littler. I guess this could be considered part of the ongoing Fleischer-Disney rivalry. Let go of our Uncle Popeye! Yuck, pig, Cut, cut, cut! Stop the cameras! Get those brats off the set! The thing about the nephews is that, yes, they do look like the direct offspring of Popeye. And how they get to be nephews with no Popeye or you know, siblings there on hand to be the parent was never fully explained and nobody really seemed to care very much. I, I love the whole conceit of like popular cartoon characters having nieces and nephews that look exactly like them, but you never meet the look-alike brother and sister that spawned these children. I kind of like the rotating nephews that come in out. Sometimes there's three, sometimes there's four. They can't really settle on names. Oh, he wants to play games, huh? Popeye becomes a victim, a, a beset victim, when faced with characters that he can't fight in the ordinary way. So Popeye becomes rather put upon, especially when the nephews come in, of course. He can't hit kids. So suddenly, this ruthless aggressor becomes the victim of the peripheral characters. Added so much to the to the cartoon, you know. Usually, it broke the mold because you're so the used to A, B, C. Well, then they popped down. They were like little birds just popping out everywhere, and they were. You wanted to kill them. They were, they were always <laughs> causing so much pain to the poor guy. You know, it's like stop it. That's what I liked about them. That they added a different element to it. I may be a shorty, but I lick the forty. He's our uncle. <laughs> 